Colossians chapter 1, and this is our wrap-up, by the way. Um, this is our last night for this class, and um, I will be gone Sunday. I'll be down in San Antonio, and I'll, um, uh, I'll be back. Uh, I'll at least be here the next Sunday, and then just early shot, so you'll understand, you'll know. Uh, th this coming Sunday and the next Sunday, the last two Sundays, we'll have a Sunday morning service. That's because Christmas is on Sunday morning, and New Year's Day actually is on Sunday morning. So the last time for the rest of this year, which is not much. Uh, we'll have, uh, after the 18th, we'll have a Sunday morning service last time. So, um, but for any of the people, students staying back or families that are not gonna be traveling and we have no clue if we are, <clears throat> um, you can feel free to not have services, but do things together. That's always nice. How many of you know you're going to be gone over Christmas? Raise your hand. Looks like Deborah's. You're, you're the only one going to be here. <laughs> Except you're leaving tomorrow, so that's okay. <laughs> okay, I guess I, I should have held those things. Uh, Colossians, chapter one. I want to read verse thirteen. Um, who hath, uh, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. All right, so most of us, if we will admit it, when we read that verse, we think of Jesus when it says, who hath delivered us? But it's the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his son. So that's talking about the Father, because it's He's talking to, about Him as the Son. So this is the this is the work of the Father. And we went over several scriptures, um, I don't know, a week ago, two weeks ago, that we um, looked at in in light of. Uh, who is this speaking of? And it was speaking of the Father, and it kind of shocked several of us. I, I uh, still have some of those scriptures. One was Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above, and we always go, okay, yeah, to Jesus, to Jesus. You know, and he delivered me from the power, of, and to Jesus. But now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all, that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. And so there is this, there is this glory that is in the church or in us because we're the church. There is this glory that comes back to the Father by Christ who is in us. By Christ who is in us. Unto him be, you know, he can do exceedingly abundantly. Unto him be glory, the one that can do exceedingly abundant. Unto him be glory uh, by Christ Jesus. And it's unto him be glory in, not by the church, throughout all ages, world without end. Um, another one was Philippians 4, where we talk, we're familiar with the, the verse, uh, but my God, my God, I, 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 I like that. I've always liked it. Paul uses my Jesus or my gospel or my God. He uses these kind of things. And when I first noticed them, I was pretty young in the Lord. And when I first noticed them, I, I was sort of, I didn't fully understand why. Because I thought, well, he's, he's all of ours. He's all of our God, or he's all of, you know, Jesus. He's my Jesus, too. You know, you can say that. Um, and 
And then I began to realize the intimacy, and, and I think it was one of those things that added to a bunch of things that began to turn my heart to, um, to not, be, not, not be so religious in my reading. Um, and many times, the, whoever shares the preacher, um, they tend to be uh, doctrinal, uh, true, true, truly right doctrines. Um, but many times in a church service or in a sharing, people tend to miss the intimacy that, that is there between the Father and the Son and is meant to be there with us. Um, and, and, and even if we have, even if we personally have um, a very intimate relationship with the Lord, we still tend to miss the scriptures that are intimate. We still make those things uh, doctrinal. And, um, but my God shall supply all your need. This is, he didn't say your God. <laughs> you know, and that would be, that'd be an encouragement then. Your God is going to do this. Our God will do, you know. But he says my God because he knows the intimacy of, of what he is able to do, but that, um, for example, the other one, he can, he can do exceedingly and abundantly. Now, we'll grab that. See, we'll grab that. Uh, and, in fact, that's verse uh, 20 in Ephesians again, Ephesians 3. We'll grab that, but not hardly even read the, the verse 21. Now, unto him be glory in the church by, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. This is, this is a... This is a glory thing to the Father, not because he did exceedingly abundantly for us. It's a glory thing to the Father in the church because it comes out of the church and it's the Son. It's the Son. It's Jesus. It's the Son back to the Father, bringing glory. This verse, sent, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches um, by Christ Jesus by Christ Jesus. Uh, now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. And uh, just one more that we looked at, well we looked at a bunch, but one more that I'll read, First Peter 5. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. And so we see this interchange constantly um, between Jesus and the Father. But we also, at least I, I mean, we also notice something about these scriptures, and that is just the ones we've read, not counting all the ones that are in there that we didn't read. We notice that the Father uh, is hidden. We never noticed him. I guess that's a funny way to say it. We noticed that the Father was hidden. We noticed. We didn't notice that the Father was hidden. We didn't notice that he wasn't, that he wasn't obvious there, that it didn't always reach out and grab us and, and scream, this is, this is the Father, and we are sons of God by Christ Jesus. And this is all in relationship to something that was deeply in his heart. We never, we hardly ever go there. We, we go, this is, this is what God does, or this is what Jesus bought and paid for. Um, but it doesn't, the, the, the uh, impact of this actually being by the Son to the Father, but now bringing us into the equation where we're actually being the benefactors of this. Because when it says, a lot of this stuff, when it says it's by Christ Jesus, it means through the cross. It means through the death. It means through the stripes. It means through the, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's you know, we go, let's well, buy Jesus. Go, Jesus. Do it, you know. <laughs> just, just heal me now. And he's going, no, I healed you. And you go, oh, yeah, when you laid hands on me. No, 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 no. When I bore your stripes. 
So you see there that you see something, if you see it, you see an intimacy of Jesus in relationship to these things. For Jesus, it cost him, cost him his life, cost him, you know, but, but, uh, but, you know, for God, the Father so loved the world that he gave his son. Well, the son also gave himself in the sense of he did that because God loved us, because he loved us. And so, uh, and I'm not talking about mushy stuff here. I'm talking about trying to recognize in the scriptures a pervading spirit that we generally miss. And I, when I say we, I don't mean necessarily us in this room or da da da, da Christianity. We tend to miss um, something that would help us to know him better or them better uh, and, and be able to act as they do or respond as they do by Christ Jesus. But, if it's, but even if we believe it's Jesus in us that does the work, there is no realization that everything that was in Jesus' heart when he came here was to give the Father what he wanted. Okay? Now, you know, maybe, I, maybe we'll get into that or maybe we won't. But everything, but that was, that was a continual motivation. And it's my desire probably maybe next class, maybe beginning this class, to just begin to get into some scriptures that just over and over and over and over and over just show that the pervading thought of Jesus, whether it's reaching forth to do something or whether it's teaching or whether it's whatever he's doing, the pervading thought is toward the Father and to give the Father what he desired, sons in the image of Christ. He was, you, you know, you could say he's consumed with it. He was certainly, his eye was single. You know. And, and um, um, but it was his heart's desire to give, isn't that great? It was his heart's desire to give the Father his heart's desire. You know, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, which is to delight yourself in the Lord. But I mean, you see that flow there, or you, we should see it, you know, we don't always see it. But um, so, uh, so this was one of those things that he's, uh, that, our, that our eyes really must be open to the Father in the scriptures and to the relationship of the Father. Um, and the reason why we don't see it isn't because, I mean, uh, my, you know, my childhood was either in an orphan or foster home or living at home with my stepfather. Uh, and his um, example wasn't very good as a father. I'm being generous. But, um, but that wasn't the reason why I wasn't seeing the father. I wasn't seeing the father because Jesus said, no man knows the father except the son. Open your eyes and you begin to see that. Well, we now, because we've been taught in a class, we now might be able to go through the scriptures and go, oh, look, he's talking about the father. But there's still, we don't know the father. We just know that scripture's talking about the father unless we know that the father wanted to do something to, which re, was in relationship to sons, and you could almost say that he wanted a family. You know, he wanted a, back in the Old Testament, uh, they called it a house. You know, the house of David meant the family of David, it didn't mean a building. Well, there's a house of David. He grew up here when he was a kid. I used to play with him. And, you know, it's not that kind of stuff. It is the family. And, and you see the prodigal son, and you see the process that he goes through, and it is the desire of the father to have sons in the image of Christ. Well, you know, he was a son, but he, he didn't understand that he was a son from the father's point of view. Do you understand that? Somebody can say, you're a son of God, and you go, okay, well, I'm a son of God. You don't know you're a son until you know it from the father's point of view. 
Because if you, you read, I'm a son of God, and you know, and then you say, well, okay, I'm a son of God. You're being a son of God from your point of view. That's just your point of view. And your point of view may not be too good. You know, it might, it might not be good at all. So, um, so a person cannot, um, and, and let me, you don't have to turn here either, but uh, 2 Corinthians 6 to 18 says this, but will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay. <clears throat> I was just reading that scripture, and you know, I, I'm thankful that this one says sons and daughters. I mean, we are sons or daughters by Christ, but, but I was reading this scripture, and it just about broke my heart in the wording of the scriptures. We go, well, that's pretty simple to me. Uh, and will be a father unto you, and you should be called the sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. This is the one that is known as the Lord God Almighty that is trying to bring about a relationship so you can know him as father. You and you and will be a father unto you, saith the Lord God Almighty. But there has to be this thing that happens, this this, you know, and we're born again, and you know, you could go, you could go to First John three, beloved. Now are the we the sons of God? Okay, when you're born again, you're born into the family. You may be a prodigal, or you may be a a, a Pharisee elder or whatever. You you know, mm -hmm. but you're in the family, but the prodigal wasn't in the house, and then later on. The elder son wasn't in the house. Do you, think the, do you think this is grievous to the father? The father goes outside the house and tries to reach us. And tries to reach us on what, what basis? On the basis of what's in his heart and the way he sees us. That's the important thing. Why do we make us the important thing? And you remember what he says, don't you? He says, goes out, and the, the elder son says, you, you know, look, I've done this, and I've never failed you, and I've been, you know, religiously right all the way through. And the father says to him, son, all I have is yours. But the word son there is not the word used in the other places. It's child. It's the actual tiknah child he's talking to the elder son child you you haven't had the the spirit of his son of the son come into your heart and cry abba father you're not saying i want to be with you father i want to know you by christ i don't want to just know the father son relationship by religious teaching and or no, uh, the other common word uh, among some of us is is sonship. I I want to know sonship. I don't want to know sonship. I want to know fatherhood. I want to know the father. I don't want to know sonship. I want you know. I'll know sonship if I know the father, because then I'll know what what being the son is in his eyes and in his heart. And so we read the story of the prodigal son, and you know we miss all kind of stuff. But but. Um, you see the you see the father looking for sons in both of those instances with both of those sons he's looking for sons he's looking for them. and so then the prodigal son shows up and he sees him heading to the house now, again, just another in my father's house. But remember, I don't, I don't think he's talking about in the building. I think he's talking about in the family. Because the father recognizes a son coming. Does that make sense? I, he's, it's, it's a family thing. It's a family affair. Um, over the years in different times and places, I've talked about the spirit of the family the spirit of the family. There is a desire 
We're sons in the image of Christ. There is a desire. Okay, so this father had two sons. And one of them looks rebellious, goes out and does a bunch of stuff, sees what his hands have produced as a son, and go, I'm not really a son without the father. I'm not. I'm, I'm me. Is that scary to anyone? Yeah. <laughs> you, it would be you or it would be me. That's not what I'm shooting for. But there has to be, just like the father was hidden, well, it's, when Jesus came to the earth, he came to the earth as a carpenter's son. He wasn't flagging everybody down saying, I'm the son of God, I'm the son of God, I'm the son of God. He didn't do that. That wasn't what was important to him. He said, when he did talk about it, he said, my father. He didn't say, the son of the father says to you, he says, my father. And how intimate when Jesus says, my father, my father. My father. So he's looking for sons, and the prodigal comes back, and the prodigal has it in his very words. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Remember when he left, he said, Give me the goods, the things of your house that belonged to me. He wasn't asking for the house. He wasn't asking for the relationship. He wasn't asking for the father. He was leaving the father. He was leaving the house. And who knows? I mean, I don't believe, I, no, this is just me. You don't have to believe this. But I don't believe he left thinking, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend everything I got. I'm going to bust hell wide open. I'm going to do all this stuff, and I'll end up in a hog pen, but bless God, I will say, at least I lived. I, don't th I think he probably was raised right, at least. He may not have understood the sonship by Christ, and therefore what was in the heart of the Father. He didn't understand that. But I think he got out there on his own, and, he, and it ended up being what it will be for all of us. You know, when it becomes about us, give me. But when he comes back, he says, Father, make me. Father, make me. Father, make me. But his heart's in a different place, and he says, make me. I'm not worthy to be called a son. Make me one of the hired servants. And the father goes, I think I'll make you as one of the hired servants. You are back in the house. You have come to your father. You have come to the things that, you remember when he's sitting in the hog pen, he's going, he's, he's eating the husks because the corn has been eaten off of it by the hogs. He's eating the husks and he goes, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> what the heck is this? As I've always said, any self-respecting Jew boy doesn't, doesn't take care of hogs, pigs, which was my first duty when I became a missionary in Jamaica, take care of the pigs on the property. And I said the same thing, what the heck? But now he, he knows there's something to eat in the father's house, but he doesn't know what the father wants to feed him. Because he's just coming, you know, I mean, I'm just putting it, I'm just saying now, maybe this is our mind. He's just coming back to get security and the blessings that God could give him and to stay in the realm of health or whatever. But he has no clue what the father wants to feed him. He just wants to eat, but the father's, He's about to get a lesson in the father's heart. So the father puts the ring on him, puts the robe on him, puts the shoes on him, all that stuff, takes him over, kills the fatted calf, and says, let's eat a sacrifice. 
let's, let's eat the sacrifice. Let's eat what we offer to God. Let's understand that this altar is what we're about. This sacrifice is what we're, this family, this is the family spirit. And this family spirit is what caused me to be looking for you because there's something in my heart. I don't want warm bodies just to call them sons. Can you hear the father say that? I don't want warm, warm bodies and just say, well, you're a son, you're a son, you're a son, you're, you're all, everything I want. He doesn't want that. He wants that which will partake with him and feast over it, not complain about the altar, but rejoice with the Father and make merry. Let's eat this. Let's enjoy this. Let's, let's show the true family spirit. Maybe the only time the true family spirit was ever released in that house can you imagine it was always in the father's heart a certain man had two sons so then he's always having to deal with sons that don't act like sons and that whole, that whole story is about the father having to deal with us because we're all out of whack in some way and out of whack in what way? In relationship to the Father's heart. Well, okay, well, we can talk about, you know, amen, we can talk about the Father's heart. We can talk about knowing the Father's heart. But I'm telling you, that that's not something you can search it out. Just like, just like we're reading the scriptures and we couldn't even see the Father in those scriptures. We saw our Savior. We saw our healer, our helper, our giver. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask us to think. But see, that's according to glory in the church by Christ Jesus, if you will. That's, that's according to the Son at work in us. Not just, I can give you all this stuff, because the prodigal son is a perfect picture of that. I don't, it's not going to be Christ in me, Father. I'm not going to be a son by that, but I'm going to be a son because I'm going to claim the new birth. But as soon as we get those exceedingly abundantly, it ends up being perverted. It does. It ends up being... Uh, and even if it didn't mention in, in John 15 that, that it, you know, he, did, he used it on riotous living and whatever, prostitutes or whatever, even if it didn't say that, if he used it for humanitarian reasons, he fed the poor and everything, he did all of these great things that, that you know, we would all applaud and go, oh my God, yeah, what a great person you are. Is that really what we want people saying about us? What a great person we are? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, there's, there's your problem right there. It's not about being a great person. It's not even about um, uh, knowing Jesus unless we know him as the son of the father. See? We, because in knowing that, we're knowing Jesus. We're knowing part of what's in Jesus' heart. Do you understand that? See, to know the Father's heart is to know what's in Jesus' heart also. It's a different angle. But to know what is in Jesus' heart is, I want the Father to get what he wants. Okay, prodigal son, do you agree with that? Nope. I want the Father to give me everything that he can give me. Well, elder son, do you agree with that? Nope. I want the Father to give me a party. He didn't say anything about a sacrifice, a fatted calf. He, he just said, I want, to, I want to party and make merry with my friends. My friends, my friends. Okay? My friends. Who, you know, the Father said, who are your friends? Well, Danny, that kid over there, no wonder you're outside the house here, throwing a fit, 
and making me have to come out here and talk you in to f trying to fellowship with your brother and with me, but that'll never happen because you don't want to eat the sacrifice. You don't want the altar. You want the party. All, all he saw was the party. He didn't see the altar over here. He didn't see the death. He didn't see the, you know, what the father and the son were eating. He just saw, you know, well, I'm left out. Okay, well, you know, I understand hurt feelings, and I understand, um, you know what, I understand misreading circumstances based on our soul. I understand that. But there has to come a day when there's something greater than I want to be a son by the father. Um, here's the expectations. I want to be a son by the father doing toward me and giving to me the things that make me feel like I'm a son. Is that, is that clear? It's clear to some. In other words, I don't want to be a father. I don't want to be a son to the father according to the cross or according to a death. This, you know, you were dead and now you're alive. Well, where did he die? In the heart of the father. Or in the hog pen? No. Where did the death take place? In the heart of the father. But now... He is a resurrected son by Christ, having passed through that death and then done more than pass through it because you don't see that death just like you didn't see the Father and you don't see the incarnated Son and you don't see the Holy Spirit and, you know, you don't see those things because they're not, they're not to be seen or will pervert them. You you. How do I say it? You, they're revealed to you. That's all I can say. They're unveiled to you. And see, the, the difference is, see, we say, well, it's by revelation. It's by revelation. It's by revelation. It's got to be by revelation. We say that over and over and over. Well, what is revelation? What is it? What is it? It's unveiling. But what is unveiling? Something has to happen for that to be uh, or adequate is not the right word, but for the, the Father and this whole thing to make sense, something has to happen before we see what's in there and we say, well, it's unveiling. No, it's renting, it's ripping the flesh of Jesus as we knew him and the cross Jesus, ripped flesh Jesus. When we see that, then we see what's beyond that. But until we see that, then we don't, we're never going to see what's beyond that because we're too busy messing around in the outer court and, you know, the holy place and the hog pen and the whatever nice places. Because if the son spent all in riotous living, I bet you he was in some pretty good places, don't you think? <laughs> you know, you, you think it's going to last forever. And, um, um, and I'll just say this. If... If, if the father really wants you to be a son, he'll see to it it doesn't last forever. Because you're, that's just a, that is, okay, that spirit of living righteously with the father's goods, and that, by the way, that all can be described spiritually. I mean, you do know that. When, you know, with right as living and with, you know, harlots and whatever. Well, that's the big crime and the, the prophets are all talking about. That's the big crime, harlotry. You're supposed to be the bride of Christ and yet you got all this other stuff going on. That's, he's, he's, that's it, that's, you know. Well, that's what's going on here. In the, in the story of the prodigal son. And then there's, then there's taking the father's stuff. And, you know, uh, I'm sure when he's at the pub or the bar or the, 
tavern or whatever you want to call it, I'm sure he's buying drinks for everybody. You know, he's, everybody's going, man, this, I am happy and you're making me happy and you're using your father's goods to bless others. <laughs> Anybody following this? And the father looks at that and see, we, we look at that and we say riotous living and harlots and sin and some, but the father looks at it and he goes, that's not my son. My son gives through death. My son loses in a spirit of loss so that others would gain. My son is identified with the fatted calf and the altar over here, not with that. And so, you know, I, here's the thing. See, I don't think he's looking at the prodigal son, if he could see all that he was doing. I don't think he's going, I hate this. Or, bless God, that's just not Jesus. Or, this is wrong. Or, you know, you know, railing and ranting about what's wrong. I think the father's heart is different. And this is me, okay? You don't have to believe this. I think his heart is different. I think it's so different from the way that he's been painted to so many of us. I think that he loves that son. That's why he's looking. He loves that son and he loves the other son. And he, he loves that prodigal son. And if he saw every act and whatever, he's got one thing on his heart. May this lead, because this is you, folks, this is where this stuff usually leads. You do know this. Let this lead to in the hog pen and he had nothing left. He'd spent all and then, and no man gave unto him. Okay? No man gave unto him. All right. So, um, he, he could have looked like it was the son. I'm spending this for others and making others happy. He could have looked like it was the son. But you see, the son, he gives all without any thought of return. He does. He gives, he gives all without any thought of return. The father's the one who saw to it. He was raised and exalted. You do realize that. Jesus didn't raise himself. A lot of people say that. And, and Jesus, you know, I forget the wording, but I've heard it, you know, and people saying, Jesus raised himself up, and da, da, da. Jesus didn't raise himself up. Just like the Father's hid, just like the Son is hid, just like the Holy Spirit is invisible and hid, they're, they're not doing this stuff theirself. And that's, you know, maybe that's what we'll deal with in the next class when we just go over a bunch of scriptures that we see Jesus' heart. One of the things, one of the major things you see in his heart is that he doesn't want to do it but he knows, he has security that if I'm functioning in this spirit, the Father and the Holy Spirit are going to take care of me. Just like, why? Because that's his thing toward the Father. See? And um, I just don't, I just don't believe that the Father is angry. I believe, if anything, when it comes to those kind of realms, he's hurt. He's hurt. Okay. But, see, he's different from us. His hurt doesn't make him go, ah, 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 no. Anyway, sorry. I'm not much of an actor, but anyway. <laughs> I think there's faith mixed in there, if you understand what I mean. That he, that that's my son, and everything is going to work toward a certain end. Now we say success. No, he says the hog pen. He, he says the hog pen. That's where we're going to end up, because we have to end up there, because we have to come to a place where we say, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, so that you can finally become one. And as long as our religious ideas and, and, and comprehensions um, can take the things of the Father 
and use them because we're a son, we're, there's only one place to go. But see, that's not, the hog pen is not punishment. <laughs> a hog pen, in a certain sense, is redemption because that's where he comes to himself, you know. That's, uh, isn't that an interesting little phrase? He came to himself. Um, and here's what I think about that. And, you know, I'm telling a bunch of stuff that I think about, so you don't have to agree with any of this. But, but I think that probably before the prodigal, and it doesn't say this in the Bible, so probably before the, the prodigal son left, I think he probably felt like he was growing up and he's a big boy now. And he could stand on his own two feet. And I think he probably had some friends that said, hey, man, you know, look. Let's go out and have some fun. Let's do a road trip <laughs> to the hog pen. <clears throat> and, uh, and so he did that, and he's, and, and he's building, or, or it is being built into him, a wrong concept of his identity, because he's a son. Is that not true? He's in the family. He's in the house. But he's this other image you know i mean it's christ in you not christ in the false image that you claim you are still with me <laughs> it's christ in the real you and uh so so i think all that's been built up and been built up and then once he's in the hog pen and once nobody's given to him and once he's you know the very you know for a jew i got nothing but hogs around me he comes to who he, who, tru, who he truly is. And while he, he's still more sin conscious than he is father-son conscious, he knows the father's house, not the building, is the place to be. See that? Because that's what he says. He says, I'm going to arise, and I'm going to go to the father on the father's house, okay? And he says, you know, and I'm gonna tell him, I am no longer worthy to be a son. Make me a hired servant. The father, you know, father ignores the hired servant part, doesn't he? Because he starts shoving a ring on him and kissing him and going, you know, oh, this, this hog pen smell is delicious, son. You know, you don't get any of that. There's only one thing. I see you differently than the way you see you, but you've come to yourself enough to realize it doesn't, it's not just an ethereal thing that happens. There's a place, and the place is the Father's house. It's not going to happen in the hog pen. See, we say, well, I'm going to just sit here in the hog pen. Oh, God, this, you just... Hit me with whatever you got. Baby, I'm ready. He's going to go, I don't, I don't really work in the hog pen. You know? I need you where I'm at. Jesus said, I must go away, but I want you to be where I am at. Where I am. And so he comes to himself and he realizes in part the father's house but he hasn't he hasn't come to the and I hate to use this word revelation of the father's heart he hasn't come I, I find no words he hasn't come to the father's heart the Holy Spirit wouldn't give me any words because it's unseen because it's hidden because right here in scriptures over and over before our eyes there is the father and there entwined in that is the son and there in simple scriptures and I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord almighty and he's going I don't want to be the Lord almighty all your life because that's the relationship most people have with him I want my son out of you, and I want, your, in, I want your heart to sing to me 
Abba Father. Because to him, it would just be like the most beautiful song that was ever written. And then, and then the elder son who has never, who is, I have never left this house. I have never failed you. I have, I, I, um, uh, you know, I have been right here, and yet you don't give me the things that make me satisfied as a son that you're really a father. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you right now, that's just, that's about as pitiful as it can get. It's, it's the best of the, the story, you know, when it comes to sons, but it's just pitiful. It's just incredibly pitiful because there is no recollect, there's no recognition of the father's heart, first of all, I mean, see, the words he said, the elder son said, are his greatest condemnation. I have been here with you all this time. Have you been so long with me and not seen the Father? You know? And we've been with Jesus a long time, never saw the Father. We're, I mean, we're just as guilty, amen? <laughs> Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So his uh, expectations, his, see, we can say expectations, but to the elder son, they're not expectations. They are the true definitions of what a father-son relationship should be. They're the true definitions in his heart because he's saying, you know, you never, you know, you claim to be a father. Where is this or that? And besides, I don't know that he would have been griping about the party as long as the other son didn't get one. As soon as he comes here, you throw him a party. You never, you know. So if that's a father thing that's going on there, see, and it was a father and a son, real relationship there over the fatted calf. He's, oh, he doesn't see the altar. He was out working in the field, being good, and he didn't see the altar, and he didn't see the death. He just sees them eating it, and the joy of the union of the father and the son. And he's, so he's going, if that is a definite, what he sees, not what, what's true, not what's the real thing, what he sees, if that's the definition of a father-son relationship, you've never done that for me. Do you, do you, does anybody see a problem with the way that we perceive things? That we can literally trample the father, literally, just like walking all over him and saying, you know, no respect, no honor due to him. It's just, well, whatever's going on here, you didn't do that for me, and this, y'all look happy, you know? And I'm faithful, but I ain't happy. <laughs> but look at y'all, you're making merry, and I want some of that, but I want it the way I understand it. Because if you'll do it this way, I'll feel like a son. Okay. Shame on us. Shame on us. This is God the Father. This is God the Father. And we can regularly do things that show no respect for what's in his heart or no respect for his person because of what we think he should be doing to prove to us that he's a father and to bring forth in me 
certain feelings and thoughts that I'm being fathered. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just sad. It, it, I know, you know, all it says is the father went out to him and the father tried to talk him to come in. And the son responded that way. And it doesn't say anything because it won't. Just like we have, to, we have to scrape in the scriptures to dig out. Oh, my God, that's the father. We don't even see it. It's like you got to really to see. Well, the father's that way. And he's just not. I mean, the father's that way and the son's that way and the Holy Spirit's that way. They're not going to tell you, you know, my greatest desire as a father was to have sons in the image of Christ and all I'm getting out of you, me, is you, you know, living in the earth just like he did. But you're doing it in a Christian way. But in your Christianity, you have built up wrong relationships with me. And you have built up wrong um, um, concepts that will keep you forever from me, says the Father. That will forever keep you from me. And my heart is, to, is there waiting for you, wanting you to come into the house, to come to me, to, to come to me in such a way where you're saying, I'm not a son. Everything I said that was son and that would deserve fatherhood, I give up. So that I might become, that I might see your heart as father and become the son that you want instead of you becoming the father that I want. So, so it doesn't, doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us his response. And it doesn't show if he wept, it doesn't show if he was hurt, it doesn't show that there, as deep as deep can be, it does show us his heart when he comes out of the feast of the crucified and the son that has embraced that and he comes out and he wants and he's trying to communicate this is where I want you not in the fields thinking that that's what I want not you know venturing off with the goods that I've given you and thinking that that, you know, I want you to stand on your own two feet and build a ministry. You know, you know all the things, you know. What I want more than anything is for you to come in with me and the son. Because it's the son now in the prodigal. You do know that, don't you? It's now the son. So he's, he's embraced the son of the father's heart. Come in with me and the son and let's just let's just eat this sacrifice together. Let's rejoice. It's not just for him, it's for you too. Come in to the very same feast and the very same food. Come in. Come in. Come on in. And from what's happening in here with us, father, son, and sons, everything else. It will grow, it will happen, it will explode, it will be what it's supposed to be. And it's funny because Jesus is telling it, and he never says any of that. But from that, then things blossom. They don't, they don't happen, they don't just happen, and they don't, they aren't, you know, except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. They don't, they're not the work of our hands. They're not the ambition of our souls. They're not the, the hopes and dreams and aspirations that we had. Um, and I say all this because I know, I know I'm, I'm talking personally is what I'm trying to say. 
but um, it's, uh, I'll just end with this, but it's the old uh, example I've used in the past of vessels. You know, I want to be, I want to be a used vessel. So the elder son goes out and he works in the fields for the father, but not, not reaching his heart, if you understand. The other one says, I want to be a vessel, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to do great things for God. But so it's, it's like the, the father in the house, in the cupboard there, he has, um, you know, different vessels. He has, a, I'll just say it like this, he has a coffee cup, he has a milk glass, he has, you know, that sort of thing. And so, you know, he opens the cupboard and he takes the coffee cup out. And he does that every morning and, and the coffee cup, when he puts it back in there and closes it, the coffee cup looks at the, the milk glass and says, you know, the Lord's really using me. He's really using me. You know, he's not using you. <laughs> and, and the son you know, the son in the, the milk glass says, I don't want to be used. I don't want to accomplish anything. I want when the father wants me, he'll reach for me and he'll pour whatever it is that he wants in me milk and it will satisfy him when he drinks. And it doesn't have to be every morning. It doesn't have to be. At his desire. Well, what does that say for all of our desires? You know what I'm saying? All of what does that say for that? Well, I have a desire to, 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 you know. And like I said, maybe next class we can go through some of those things with Jesus. And when we see him, what we will see is uh, the son that changed the world, that affected so many lives that we can't number. In fact, the scriptures in Revelation says without number. Who simply said the works I do are not going to be my own. The words I speak are not going to be my own. And we're going to see that, that from that position more can happen than you know, from, you know, I, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. All right, let's take a break.